It's my great pleasure to introduce James O. Clark, whom we uh, affectionately know as Jim. Uh, Jim is a sculptor who works with materials such as car parts, fog machines, neon, and live chickens. His work's been exhibited nationally and internationally, including 10 solo exhibitions and over 80 group shows. He's received m numerous awards and honors, including the 2008 Sidney Simon Sculptural, Sculpture Award at the National Academy Museum in New York, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in 1998, a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship in 1989. Those are very hard to get. Uh, an individual artist awards, two individual artist awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, one in 1982 and one in 1983. That was back before uh, Jesse Helms got his hands on the NEA and forced them to stop uh, writing grants to individual artists. His work has been uh, reviewed in such publications as Sculpture Magazine, Art in America, The Brooklyn Rail, Art Forum, The Village Voice, The New Yorker, and The New York Times. He's exhibiting uh, widely this year, um, including Slideshow Nation 3 at Slideshow Gallery in Brooklyn, which is up now through March 15th. Paparazzi 4 at the Janet Kurnatowski Gallery in Brooklyn through February 15th, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Invitational, which will open March 12th and run through April 13th. Jim received a BS, we all know he has a lot of BS in him, from <laughs> Cutstown State University in Pennsylvania in 1974. He lives uh, and maintains a studio in Williamsburg, uh, and last but not least, he gave me this hat. Yeah. He's been teaching here since 2012. Please join me in welcoming Jim Clark. The lights go down, right? And I move it this way, right? When I move it, I go up and down, right? Okay. Uh, well, I heard Marshall McLuhan say this one time, and I know some of you who know me have heard me say it. I feel like a mosquito in a news colony. I don't know where to start. Uh, okay, so we got to start somewhere. So when I was born, I was very young. And about the age of 12, <laughs> uh, somebody got it, good. Uh, at the age of 12, I started w watching the original Twilight Zone. And it was a guy named George Clemens who did the lighting on the Twilight Zone that really, you know, I didn't get it at the time what all the political ramifications of that program was about, you know. But over the years, I've watched it, all the segments with my daughter, and they all came back, and I realized how amazing Rod Serling was as a, you know, a writer and all that. <clears throat> and in the, in the mid-'60s, I was still in high school and I saw this movie called Blow Up. And this guy named Michael Antonioni did this film and it stuck to my ribs. And I thought, what is going on here? There's something magical about that ending. And then I read what Antonioni had said. And what he said was, I want to paint with film the way an artist paints on canvas. He made another movie, he made quite a few movies, but he made a movie called Red Desert that was just amazing. He said when he made that movie, he was thinking of Rothko's paintings. And he also made a movie called Passenger, and there's a show up right now called Zabriskie Point. It's downtown at Jack Hanley Gallery, and it has a lot of the elements of the movie in the, in the gallery at this time to check out. So moving on, in the 70s, I started watching films, and I got kind of attached to this woman named Lena Wartmuller's films. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool stuff. You know, she did Swept Away, Seduction of Mimi, and she did Seven Beauties. And I thought, hmm, okay. And then I was in the service, and a guy down in Austin, Texas, was a friend of mine, and I gave him a chicken. And I thought, damn, you know, this guy needs a chicken. So I gave him a chicken. 
I'll tell you, my friends are, you know, I'm a lot of work, you know. The guy took the chicken and he was really happy and I thought, good, this chicken thing works. So I went to college and I went to a bunch of different schools and I decided to start pulling these pranks with chickens. So I would go to a McDonald's or a Colonel Sanders with my chicken under my arm and say my chicken wanted a job. <laughs> and then it didn't, wasn't received very well, so I decided I'd work on some artists that were in the neighborhood. And this sculptor named Harry Batoria, who made some wonderful furniture for Knowles Industry, made a Barcelona chair, and made some beautiful sound sculpture. I knocked on his door with my chicken, said I was working my way through college trying to sell chickens. So that sort of developed an unusual friendship, as you can imagine. <laughs> and I got to know Harry a little bit. And then it always gets down to what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Well, you know, it's honestly the dog. While stumbling around the woods of Pennsylvania, my dog was digging a lot. And as she dug, I painted. So I started painting all the roots around the area, trying to get to the basis of all this. And she kept me busy. Well, she was quite a digger. And I, was, you know, and I didn't know what I was doing. I, so I kept painting the roots. So eventually, this was the first time that I started letting art get out of my jurisdiction and letting other things take, take place. So now that now I have to tell you before I go much further, I'm going to rewind and fast forward. Every time I rewind, it was 40 years ago that the dog was digging. And I'm sure she's history now, but uh, I hope not. So in 2009, this lovely lady had a gallery uptown near to Whitney, and she said, right next to where Leo Castelli's gallery was, and she said, I would like you to do an outdoor installation. Sound good to me. She said, you can do whatever you want. And I smiled, and I said, can I? And she said, yep. And I said, OK. <laughs> so I went up there, and I had done all my homework. I mean, everyone would be proud of me because I had a folder. And I opened up the folder. And I said, this is my, my intent. And she said, OK, what's your intent? I said, my intent is simply this. I'm going to have smell in the garden. I went to my friend David Cap. His father has a, a scent factory or makes odors or whatever for fragrances. So I had to smell of lot, I'm not sorry, it was uh, roses and uh, lilacs, I believe it was, or yeah, it was lilacs. And I said, we can have these smells outdoors. I have a machine that makes the smells. Oh, she said, I like roses. I said, great. And I said, I have these bubbles, and they're different colors. They're going to come down, and they're disappearing colors. So when they hit your clothes, they won't stain. She said, OK. And I said, and I got this idea of a, a water fountain thing, and I got singing fish, and I have <laughs> goldfish and I got fiber optics, and I got this thing that throws mist in the air that when the sun hits it right, makes a rainbow. And she was just all excited. And then I showed her this picture. <laughs> she said, what is this? I said, it's a tie-dyed chicken. And she said, how does that fit in? You asked for this, so I'm giving it to you. I said, well, I want to put tie-dyed chickens in this show. She said, you can't have chickens in New York City. And I said, yes, you can. New York City is a chicken-friendly city, <laughs> which it is. So these are the players in the show. So she said to me, you can't do this. I said, yes, I can. You've got to trust me. And she did trust me. And it did kind of, it did work out more than I expected it because people were still talking about this. So the tie-dyed chickens came in. 
And the little ones had diapers on them that were tie-dyed. And then there's this chicken. This is the chicken that carries the camera. I decided that the one chicken, it would be a chicken cam, and the chicken would carry a camera and photograph everybody during the opening. <laughs> now, Werner Herzog said that chickens are stupid. And I thought, hmm, okay. He said, you know, they got flat brains. And I thought, wow, okay. But I know a movie that he did called Stasik. I believe it's, I may get this pronunciation wrong, Stosik. And he was filming a chicken dancing. And his whole crew walked out on him while he was filming. They told him he was absolutely off his rocker and they were so upset with him. And he spent all the rest of the time filming and editing the film and he finally got to a point where they all left, and he has nine minutes of a chicken dancing at the end of the movie. <laughs> this is all research I've done since I've done this piece, by the way. Uh, I looked in this chicken's eye, and I, just like you're looking at it now, and I said, chicken, if you do this for me for three hours, carry this camera around on your back, I will put you in Chicken McMansion in Brooklyn. You will live like no other chicken has ever lived in its life. So. Here we go. This is happening. Poetry in motion. Uh, now, the magic of this very short film I'm going to show you is you'll see the little ones with the diapers on and the tie-dyed chickens, but the, my friend is photographing the chickens and it's being live streamed at the same time, the chicken with the camera on his back. So you get a brief moment of this encounter a symbiotic relationship between a chicken and the individual. That was, what happened was that lasted for three hours and I have to report that all the chickens were in high gear and they were doing their thing. And then I built a beautiful chicken coop for them and insulated and they live in the lap of luxury in Brooklyn. And then all of a sudden I was asked to be in a show and I thought, hmm, I would like to put a laser on a chicken. And I learned a lot. I don't know if the chicken did or not, but I used a thing, a chicken called a silky hen and the silky hen has a furry surface and she has black skin. And when the laser hit her, it actually, as you can see, it, it kind of, it didn't become a point anymore. It became a blend into the, the fur. And this was shown at Sideshow Gallery with 500 artists. And it was a little difficult for them to digest a chicken in a gallery. But it was over the door and everybody walked in and had to look at her bottom. So that was that one. And then I moved on with another idea of a chicken. This chicken reminds me of a piece that Rauschenberg did when he was on roller skates and he had a parachute. What's going on here is the chicken is, it's got a helium balloon and a helium actually membrane balloon. It's got LED light, not, L yeah, they're, uh, they're called electroluminescence wire, and the chicken's walking around, and she's so petite that she's almost levitating as she walks. So, so that's that. And then, you know, I wanted to leave these chickens alone, but they keep coming back to me. I decided to do something a little more adventuresome, and I decided to use a chicken to make an etching. And I got some soft ground copper, now we gotta escape this.
Okay, so that was a chicken making the etching, and I have the etching. There it is. So that's been the last project with the chicken for now. And now we're gonna, we're gonna go back in time. 40 years ago, I was hanging lights in trees in Pennsylvania, and I was, I just gotten out of school. I had two, Terrific guys down there that I never had a class with, but they were very important to me, James Kelly and James Carroll. Now, what James Carroll did after I'd gotten out of school is he invited people down, different artists. And uh, some of the artists he invited down were, uh, one of them sitting right here, Gary Steffen, and Ken Flater. Now, those two artists had a big impact an imprint on my life at that moment because they were saying, you got to get out of the woods of Pennsylvania. Well, here I am digging in the ground like my dog was, sticking lights in the ground. I was having a pretty good time and uh, sticking lights in snow. And I thought, wow, how much further can I go? Then I started sticking lights underwater and Richard Serra came down and said, wow, you know, you're on to something. He said, I don't quite know what you're on to, but you're on to something. And he was very supportive and generous. So I never lost my contact with Gary or Kent and they kept the suggestion that I come to New York. Here's another piece I did at that moment and I started putting lights on diagonals in the water because it actually it mirrors itself but it bends as the light hits the water. It's called the Weber Fechner law where it refracts as it goes into the body of water. You may know this as you go into a swimming pool you, where you step is not necessarily where the bottom of the pool is. And here's the last piece I, I really have from that series in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania where it's floating lights in water. Now, <clears throat> Gary had found a place for me and he doesn't remember this. I actually brought his attention. Uh, it was on Canal Street. It was at the end of Canal Street, right at the, the Bowery. And it was like $180 a month. That was way over my budget. I had this idea I could find a place for like hundred bucks. So I looked and I looked. I started looking in January of 77 and I didn't find it until like 1977 uh, but it was in May. I found this spot right here. This is 250 South Street and the guy who had this place for rent had a, a, a trucking business beside us. I took the t very top floor and this is a good example of a sculptor not getting what it's like to have a top floor of a building and dragging materials up. He told me at the time that there would be no other artists in the building. I was really very happy to hear that, that I would be here all alone like I was out in Pennsylvania. The next week I came in and on the fourth floor, Bill Jensen and his wife-to-be, Margaret Leachick, was there. And a week later, Kiki Smith takes the third floor. And on the four fourth week, another sculptor named Joseph Egan takes the ground floor. So this is one of the first artists I met in New York City. His name's Guy Goodwin. This is a, period, this is a painting from that period. This is Margaret Luchik's painting, and this show, she has a painting that's show up right now at Grand Army Plaza. And if you get a chance, it's over in Brooklyn, get a chance to see it, I highly recommend it. This is a painting of Bill Jensen's from that period. He, what happened, and I'll give you a quick rundown, is I was working upstairs with materials and a lot of water and it was coming down and Bill had a studio out in Williamsburg with Bob Grosvenor and he said, you know, you really should come out to Williamsburg and get a studio out there with us. So they invited me out there and I got involved with them in a building out on South 3rd Street in Williamsburg. And this is a sculpture Bob made at that period of time. And it's, that was a boat he brought into the yard and he carved it and whittled it 
put it back together. And that was Williamsburg in late 70s, early 80s, when no art dealer or no artist would even get near the area. Okay, this is me back in Manhattan. I started working with helium, and because I'm around all these artists, and at that time, working with metal was so big, it was, was kind of, it was of the essence. I decided that I would work with weight and how to lift weight, so I realized that lights only weigh so much, and if I put them in a helium situation, they'll lift the mass of weight. So this piece is called Daisy, and what's, this daisy is act, actually has a lot to do with what's coming in the future because I couldn't create this piece because of the, some of the problems technically that was, was not in, in the stars at that moment. And this piece was shown at the new museum and this piece is a piece that I realized and what happened at that moment is I got a hold of a guy named Billy Kluver. And Billy Kluver worked for Experimental Art and Technology. Along, it was actually Robert Whitman and Robert Rauschenberg's brainchild in Kluver and Walthauser were the two technical people working with it. I called Billy Kluver and I said to him, I gotta do these structures that go in the air and have to be held in space for a show at the new museum. And, and I explained the situation. He said, technically, you cannot do that. So, here you go. Anytime somebody tells an artist you can't do something, you know you have to do it. <laughs> Technically, it cannot be done. Mechanically, it can be done. And the way I resolved it was, I, re I was doing plumbing at the moment, and when you do other things in life, they filter back into your work. And I realized the way a plumbing fixture works is in a bathroom when you flush a toilet, the ball cock comes down. When it lifts up, it shuts off and it closes the valve. I've put a micro switch on the piece that when it lifted the balloon up, it shut it off. It shut the air going into it. This is another piece in that point. And what I did with this piece is I brought it from Pennsylvania to New York and I put it in a new environment and it seemed to, to work fine. It was also in that show. And then this is a sculpture I did at that moment. It was argon and light. Okay, fast forward, we lost we lost the building on South Street. We lost the building on South Third Street. We pulled up to this building, and I knew it was for sale. It's called Colored School Number no. Three by the Landmark Society. It was built by the Quakers for black children in 1879. I knew all that. I pulled up with my wife, and I said, what do you think? And she looked at it. There were holes through the roof. There were no windows, no plumbing, no electricity, zero. And it was just a show. And she said, well, I can live anywhere, but I can't live with you if you're not making art. So we bought it. Since then, the building has been landmarked. It's safe. It's going to be here till the cows come home. And I don't hope they don't come to Brooklyn for a while. OK, I met this painter, and he is very important. He's a painter that went from painting the sculpture. He, was a friend of Al Held, his name is Ronnie Bladen. I now work with this man's estate, Ronald Bladen, with another fellow named Ramon Alcalea. Bladen started out, came down from Canada to uh, San Francisco, was part of the Beat Generation with Jack Kerouac and all them, and then he moved with Al Held, Yvonne Rayner, from San Francisco to New York City. He painted with Al Held, Al Held said he drove, I know this oral history because I heard it from the, from the source, Held said he drove me crazy. He would start at the top and pull the painting down like a window shade. And he said, and he'd walk away and I'd still be struggling in my studio. This is a sculpture that Bladen is known for. It was shown at the Jewish Museum in 1966. It's called Primary, Primary Structure Show. Now, I'm doing a lot of research on Bladen. I went to Alex Katz, who got Eva Hess and Ronnie Bladen into the shows at Fishback Gallery. And when we interviewed Alex Katz, he said there were two artists that really assassinated that primary structure show, Carl Andre and Ronnie Bladen. And I said, really? So I had to go to Carl Andre, and I said, what do you think, Carl? And Carl looked at me. We had it all on tape now, and he, said, he looked at me and laughed. 
He said, Alex Katz is absolutely wrong. He said, Bladen made the masterpiece, I made a work of art. So that was very generous. And then these are the last sculpture, one of the last that Ronnie made before he died. And what I want to just let you know is how, many, how much an artist develops and changes through their career. Okay, uh, in 86 I was invited to Art Park to do a piece. I tried to find an area there that was not touched by artists before that. Art Park was an idea, it was a brainchild of Robert Smithson's in the early 70s before he died. And uh, it was a beautiful moment in time. It gave a lot of artists areas to work. They didn't have it as a conduit to feed it back into the community and the education between the community and the artists were lost. So this is the location I decided to take. It was a swamp. Well, as you know, I'm not always the shiniest apple on the tree, the brightest apple, so. I got this building, that was my, uh, the building I worked with, and I said, can I use that as a work of art? And he said, sure. So I took it and I started driving pilings in to make a dam up. I drove the pilings in, I took a torch, I cut across. As you see the black line coming out, that's my, it comes over this white pipe, which is my overflow. The building, I've to torn the sides off of it. And then at this point, the building is in the water. It didn't quite go this fast, but it went in the water. I painted it with something called uh, vinyl spray, and it's called cocooning. It was used in World War II to cover ships and uh, aircraft. After that, they use it down in Florida. Any place there's large surfaces to cover the roofs up. And then this is the piece at nighttime. Okay, in 85, 86, Judy Pfaff moved to Williamsburg. She was, became a neighbor of mine with Ursula von Reidingsvard. And that's Ursula's piece from that period. And in 89, I had a show with Max Protec. This is a sculpture I put in the show. And the idea of its setting on fiberglass, I wanted to create a nest for the sculpture. And I also made this piece, and it's the idea of having a round surface rather than a pedestal for the piece. And this piece is concrete. I was really working with a lot of materials. It was My sculpture at that point was very much material driven. And when I was at Skowhegan, I said to the students one time, the light was just like a light switch. It's just to get you into the sculpture to look at it. And as soon as you understand something about your art, it's like, it, like an elusive butterfly, it disappears. So I kind of got out of that zone. And now this piece is a piece I did at the same time, and it's an inflatable, and it's, it's the, the containment is, is actually vinyl and polyethylene. And I, and I searched since Daisy, way back then, for a product that I could heat seal. And DuPont said, we're working on it, we're working on it. So finally, when I got a hold of DuPont, called me and said, we have that material. They were going to use this for, uh, for advertising, but it got into a problem with the airspace and all that. So it never really was put on the market, but I was able to get a hold of the material to put it in my work. And again, I used like the pillows to kind of give it a little more of a, a human feel. This is another piece I did at that time, and it, what it is, is it's incense. In, it's a spearmint of incense in the sculpture that gives it a smell. So when you come in the room, you actually smell the piece before you saw it. This is a, the piece I did at the Academy, and this is balloons, and they're suspended in space. The green one comes out about 12 foot, and the, the purple one is like more like 14 foot. There's no guidelines. I figured out a way of rigging them so they would be horizontal in the space. This is another piece I'd done down in Soho. And what this piece is, it's being suspended between these two wall surfaces. And the inflatable part is holding the light in space. So another one is a little more recent. And it's, it's being suspended in space by, uh, by the air in, in the structures. This is, a, this is vinyl and, and argon light being bent, and it's soft vinyl, so I'm able to drill holes and put the light through it. <laughs> okay, I did a show back a while ago, and it was called Tulips Hysteria Coordinating, and it was for 
a piece Duchamp was supposed to put in a 1917 uh, independence show, and he didn't put that Tulip's Hysteria coordinating <coughs> painting in the show. What he put in was R. Mutt. So I decided I was going to put R. Mutt in this show and dedicate it to Duchamp's Tulip's Hysteria coordinating painting that he never made. So this is the entrance, and then this is inside the gallery. And what I did was I went wall to wall and put inflation and put neon, and you can see there's a a fiber optic cable going into a water vat, and there were some bubble machines going on there, and there were some, some laser lights going on also. And this is a piece I did in a gallery where I, I in, and what I did was I, it was all, this is the beginning, I using motion switches, and the motion switches were turning off and on, so the floors, it was working on the lighting the floor surface. Okay, this piece, it's called Mew Museum. It's done by Forrest Myers, and it was done with six other artists, and it's a piece that was put on the moon's surface on, on the Lunar 12 landing. It was put on the leg of the Lunar 12 piece. Uh, and I often make a connection between Myers and Calder, because Calder was looking at the moon when he was coming across the ocean and thinking about how he could make a sculpture that would be suspended in space and float. And that was really a breakthrough in sculpture. It was a breakthrough because sculpture was no longer on the wall or on the floor. It was actually suspended and it was kinetic and it was, you know, it was, he owned it. It was a big deal. And Myers did this, and I think this is quite a big deal too. And the guy, Fred Wallhauser, is the guy that helped him maneuver this, and he was with art and technology. Now, recently I was asked to be in a show with Myers, and this is a piece at Regina Rex. He has the screen with the technology, and he made that couch. I have a piece suspended here, and the piece is fiber optic. Now, here's a better picture of my piece, and the piece has a lot to do with Sotomasso Montenago. And Sotomasso Montenago was part of the Gutai group. He showed at Martha Jackson Gallery with the Gutai group in the, in the 50s. At that time, they were, they were just completely dismissed as an art movement. And the Guggenheim just recently had a show of theirs. So he did bags with color, but they didn't change color. And the fiber optic cable is actually physically holding this in place. This is another sculptor, the first sculptor I met when I was in the city, Tom Bills. This is a small piece of, a, of Mark de Sue Rose. And this is a painting by somebody that you should know. His name is Lenny Contino. He was hurt at the same time de Sue was in the 60s. Lenny has been in a wheelchair since that period of time. He paints every day. He's quadriplegic. And he's having his first one-man show this year <clears throat> at Mitchell Algas Gallery down Low East Side. First commercial gallery show, and he's in his 70s. God bless him. This is a painting by John Walker, who I met when I was at Skowhegan. And this is a painting by Jake Berteau, who was a teacher here for quite a few years, and he just passed away last month. Okay. Uh, we're going to rewind again, 40 years, and <clears throat> while we're, we're rewinding, I have to tell you that I, I, I did these pieces at the time, and I didn't know what I was doing. I'm not so sure that I, at least I can tell you what I think I was doing at the time now, but I'm going to show them to you, because I never showed them before, and I can make connections. These are pieces that work with the edges of of the surfaces, and here you go. This is the beginning of light on defining the edge of something. So I did these. I never showed them. To, this is the first time I ever showed these in public. And I knew there was something going on here, but I didn't know what it was until I started making some recent work. And I found this electroluminescence wire 
and, I, and all this stuff is bent by hand. I bent all these pieces, and I started working the edge. So I rewind 40 years, and I catch up to it finally. And these are pieces that are relatively new. OK, now we're going back. We're actually rewinding back. This is the first sculpture that I did. Now, I used light, and it was before there was a problem with AIDS and all that. I, would, I don't know exact, I didn't understand this piece for a long time, but I can tell you that I put in a show that was curated by Gregory Babcock. And if you look on the side, there's postage. Now, the postage was to where the piece was going. And then they turned the piece around. I cut a hole in the box, and the postage is on the other side of the piece. Now, I didn't know at that time about Anna Banana or Ray Johnson or Cavallini. Or those, they were doing mail art. But I wasn't interested totally in mail art. I was mail meaning post mail art. It was, I was interested in this piece physically going somewhere and physically coming back. And I've got a moment, a little tiny moment, a wisp of what it was about. What it was about was the idea of making a containment for a sculpture that I could travel with. So what I did was I didn't want a point and plop sculpture, because I know Kent talked about that, Kent Flader, going back 40 years about sculpture being point and plop. I wanted a meaning for it. So I, I didn't want a cube. I wanted to be able to put the sculpture in the container, ship it, and then pull it out of the container, and then again lose the ownership of it a little bit because that soft vinyl, when whoever puts it on top of that container, it has they get their personality into it. So these are relatively new, and the container is part of the, the piece and part of the transportation of it. Okay, this is a piece I'm working on now, and it's somewhat like everything else. It's motion switches, so you come in, you turn the piece on, and the piece is a bubble machine, and the bubble machine has color in it. Some of the colors, in this case, they're, they're fluorescent, and they, they're coloring the paper. So the individual actually comes in, turns it on, and they are making the piece themselves. The viewer is making the art. And it's, it's not heavy-handed, so the, it's how you walk around the piece helps to create the piece. Here's actually one of the watercolor pieces. I had watercolor in it for a while. I was running watercolor through it. Here's a piece that's just done last year, and it's a skin on another skin on another skin held up with a vinyl inflatable skin with lights on it, carrying a mass. And this is the end of the show. This is Snowball Does Not Bite. It was, it's, actually, it's actually titled, when I was five years old, my friend and, uh, came over with his, an older relative and said, what about that dog? I said, Snowball don't bite. And by that time, he had him by the seat of the pants. <laughs> so I had to relive that moment and this is the sculpture that did it. Now, I'm almost done. I have to say, 60 years ago, I had a dream I wanted to be an artist. And I'm living that dream. And let the force be with you. That's it. Well, I was five years old. The dog was a bushy white dog, and his name was Snowball. And I, I know, and, and I know that's bad literature, but you know, it's, it's been haunting me, and I thought, how can I put a title to this piece? Now, titles are magical, and how people title pieces are always a magical thing. Now, everybody else is calling the piece Snowball. They don't care about the don't bite. I was talking about the dog don't bite, but it did bite. I mean, that was an after-the-fact thing. <laughs> now, 
Well, actually, that's a great question. And the truth of the matter is that at the time, I was going at this. I was, no, you know, there's nobody that can tell you how to do this. And I, I stumbled through a lot of problems. I finally got to a point where I was able to use polyester resin as a sealer between the two things. But when I first started out, I was using silicones and all that, and I was getting the pieces of light. And like I said, when Sarah came down, the piece didn't light. And I would come out of the water, and I was completely out of my mind, and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know this. I don't know that. And Richard said to me, you know, you remind me of a friend of mine. And it was his best friend, and I didn't know who he was talking about. I said, yeah. He said he was saying the same thing. He was going around putting sticks in water, and he was making this thing. And he said, I don't know what I'm doing. He said, you sound just like him. And I looked at him. I said, well, who was that friend? He said, Robert Smithson. See, they were very, very close at the time, and, and he was with him when he was building the spiral jetty. But to get, what happened is, like, when I say about, you know, I bought a building and I was putting it together, and there's something called a GFI. It's called a ground fault interrupter. And by the time I did the piece at Art Park, the floating building, I had known that there's a way to protect yourself from electricity. And I had a GFI, and the GFIs are what you see in a bathroom or around this kitchen sink to protect you from getting electrocuted. And I had incorporated them into pieces. And I am here right now, my friend, to tell you they exist because some kids <laughs> broke some of those pieces and electricity went through the water and it just like that it shut off. So they work, you know. So if you it's tricky, but you should really always have a protection, you know, on that kind of situation. You know, I'm going to give you a lot of answers, but I don't know if I can give you the truth. <laughs> you know, no, I'm serious. I'm not trying. You know, I think it's a fair question. I mean, I knew ch chickens you're allowed to have in the city. I mean, we carried it on the subway. They they were in animal crates. We were able to move them around. Uh, the idea of them being so ingrained in our history, like Socrates on his dying bed, they had all the scholars around. And he says to Ciro, he says. Did we give the neighbor the rooster that we owed him down the street? And he died. So there's this, yeah, so there's this history of importance to, to, that are, you know, they're prehistoric. You know, these are, they're odd items, you know. Yeah, yeah, well, when the chicken was in the show in Brooklyn, people went crazy. And you can, I mean, I can under, and I won't, I mean, I'm, I wasn't trying to be insensitive to anybody else. But what happened was they come in complaining to the, the owner of the gallery, and he said, they slaughter them two blocks down. These chickens live better than you do. He said, you can go to their house. When they're tie dyed, it's all natural dyes, and they all wore, you know, they go through a molting thing, and the, you know, the color goes away. They're part of my family. You know? <laughs> you know? Well, I think that you, you, you know, you have to draw. I mean, I think anybody that makes, you know, drawing and sketching is very important to the creative process. I mean, I know it's, you know, some people, I know a lot of sculptors that don't feel that way, I mean, but I certainly think that drawing is so important, and I mean, like I talked about the twilight zone, the light and the shadow and all that is so, like that is, I made drawings that have all that in them, you know, like I didn't make the connection, so I think if you don't draw, it, it helps you connect line to to whatever you're working with, with next material. It's like, you know, there's drawing and painting. There's drawing and sculpture. It goes back and forth. It goes from the, a flat surface to a three-dimensional surface or a painting surface. It's there, you know? You make them live. I'm serious. I mean, you know, like I, I did that chicken. I mean, there were a lot of people around, and people talk about it, you know? They, it's just... You know, it's not about commerce. It's just about an act. It's something I do, and other people think that, well, they're pretty unusual, you know? I mean, I'm not, 
it's, I'm just following my nose, you know? I hope that helps. I mean, I'm not trying, I, I'm not in the marketplace for this, you know? Neon has been around for over 100 years, and some of the neon was first made is still working. Uh, fluorescent light is not the same. It's, been, it's problematic for people who are trying to restore Dan Flavin's work. Like, technology moves very fast, uh, very fast. And recently, I just, I just saw something in 1955, a guy comes on who was around when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. He was in his 90s, but th that's not a big jump. But in the 60s, all of a sudden, <laughs> slides are big. And now I looked, at, recently Dia had a thing on Flavin. I went there, and the slides are all faded out. And, you know, slides are obsolete now. So technology moves fast. It's hard to keep up with it. However, like, like in Dan Flavin's case, the, the red lights and blue lights and those colors are not made anymore by the company. So, you know, I try to use sleeves over them. If I, if I do work like that, I put a polycarbon and sleeve over to work. It's white and I put a, you know, to get a gel surface on. Well, that's a deep question. Uh, I think why I showed him this way is because everything you do is important to your own development as an artist. You can't always catch up to it. It takes time to catch up to your whole process. So you have to somehow keep some kind of track of it, whether you're doing it through JPEGs or you're doing slides or obsolete, but you've got to keep track of what you're doing. If you do filming, you have to keep some kind of record of it so you can go back to it and revisit it. You know, you don't, like the leaf falls off the tree, but it never goes that far. So it's all you. It's how you assemble it and put the puzzle together. It's all important. Like when I was a kid, I was sticking, uh, I was taking flashlights apart and sticking them in the sockets and blowing out fuses, you know? <laughs> I was filling balloons up with water and flooding the house. I was doing all kinds of things that didn't make sense, but it was some kind of inner voice telling me to do it, you know? And I suggest following your inner voice, just be careful and sensitive to other people's voices. You know, or you'll get moved to Williamsburg. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think you can do it in a lot of different ways. You can, you know, how I do it is, you know, I just show you what I do, you know? I mean, like, I didn't show you the body of work. I showed you bits and pieces of it. And, you know, the idea of, you use the word fun, and I'm gonna have to, Gary, I'm gonna have to say something he told me a long time ago. You know, there's this whole idea of art as being fun. You know, it's serious business. I mean, it takes a lot of guts to be an artist. I mean, it's not, Believe me, being an artist, you know, it's not for sissies. It's a real lifetime commitment. And like, you know, Gary had said a long time ago to me, he said, you know, it, you know, people get this idea of being an artist and they think that it's glamorous. Well, there's moments when, you know, when you go to a place and you get celebrated and all that, but basically when you go in the studio and you close the door, it's you and the work. I mean, the truth is in the pudding. What you're able to stir up and concoct and marinate and celebrate is the end product, you know? And you, as you work, you should write. You should keep notes. I mean, you know, that, it'll, it'll fall in place. You just gotta trust your, your, you know, your whole thing. If you don't do that, if you don't, tr you know, nobody m is holding a gun to your head. You don't have to do this, you know? But if you are doing it, you better, you know, dig in, you know, it's a long haul. Ah, boy, that's a tough one. I don't, I think that's a good question, and I think that I don't, can't, I can try to answer it, but it's complex. You know, like the piece at Sideshow was for Jake Berto, and it's called Use More Green. Jake, a dear friend for years, I had to go talk at Boston, there were all painters, 
and he said to me, it's easy, Jim. You just go there and you just tell him to use more green. I said, really, Jake? He said, man, you have no problems at all. I said, well, I'm a sculptor. I don't know how to talk to, you know. He said, just, you know, no problem. I walk in the first studio and all the paintings are monochromatic green. <laughs> and I said, oh my. And the, and the artist said, what do you think? And I said, I gotta call Jake. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just a, you know, what a lot of this is, is a celebration of friendship, community, and you know, hills and valleys, you know, it's, it's all about hills and valleys. If you, you know, if you don't, if you can't stand the roller coaster, then it, you shouldn't be on it, you know. Yeah, 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 I welcome it any time I can get a chance, you know. Uh, the show I did, Tulips Hysteria Coordinating, it was completely, the guy left, he came back, he said, you took my gallery from me. And I said, well, you left, you told me to do what I wanted to do. Uh, the woman the same way, she was very generous, she let me do what I wanted, you know. I mean, those, you know, that doesn't happen very often, but when it does, does you know as you know I don't get to do very many installations or anything like that but I'm very happy to do them so you know I think we should be as flexible as possible in any environment we're placed in like I showed that small sculpture of Marcus Suvros for a reason because he's known for giant pieces he also makes little things you know it's the idea of turning up the volume and turning it down you know you you should have that flexibility in your work. I think that's a great question. Uh, I, you know, when I was still out in, out in PA, people said to me, what do you want from coming to New York? And I said, well, I want to be in the community with artists and I want to res that I respect and that respect me. I said, you know, that's the main objective. I want to be in the community. I want to develop a relationship with the community. And they said, well, what about showing your work? And I said at the time, I felt that was secondary. I thought, you know, like being with other artists that are of like minds, that are trying to do something to progress their own identity was so important. So I pushed for that, and I still push for that. I mean, yes, I came to New York. Yes, my first show was New Museum. Yes, I've had a lot of success. But you know, it's because I have a great community of friends. You know, I mean, it's a lonely world if you don't have friendship in it, you know? And I believe that in my heart, that if I didn't have the con connections I have, you know, because, you know, after a show, it's pretty rough, man, I'll tell you, you know? You come down with your show. I mean, there's no in-betweens about it. And, you know, while the opening's there and everybody's wah-la-la, at the end, you, it's a pretty lonely moment. I think that that's when you, you, know, you have that wonderful moment of, of having a dynamic group of people. And I really, I believe that's important, and I believe that's important to share and give to the other people. I was told in 1977, or 70, whenever I gave my first lecture, that I couldn't speak about another artist. And I said, uh-uh, I am not gonna get up in front of a bunch of people and, and be a song and dance man. I believe in these other artists, I'm gonna talk about them and celebrate them. And I think it's important because it, you know, it's a complex world and it's not about one individual. It's about a, you know, it's a community. And the community isn't just about dollars and cents, it's about, you know, it's about different things. It's about, you know, growing and it's, a, it's, an, or, it's an organic thing. <laughs>